33-year-old Janelle Melton lived in Neptune City, New Jersey in 2009. She had an apartment in the Brighton Arms apartment complex. Janelle worked as a social studies teacher at Red Bank Middle School in New Jersey. She had a passion for history and knew how to get her students into it. On September 14th of 2009, Janelle still had not shown up for school by 8 a.m. It was an important day as she had a guest speaker lined up for her students. The school secretary asked Janelle's estranged husband, Michael Melton, to go check on her at her apartment. Janelle met Michael after college. He said he used to flirt with her a bit. They started dating and got married in Jamaica in August of 2003. They both became teachers at Red Bank Middle School. The marriage was good for about three years. Michael said he wasn't used to so much affection or having someone love him so much. He had started a basketball company and was gone a lot. Michael eventually filed for divorce. Janelle became comfortable having her own space. They were still cordial and spoke on the phone every day. When Michael received the phone call from the school secretary that Janelle did not show up for work, he immediately drove to her apartment. He saw Janelle's car in the driveway. He entered the house and called out her name. He walked into her bedroom and saw her on the floor. Janelle had her nightgown on and Michael saw what looked like blood on it. It appeared to him that she had fallen while she was putting her makeup on. He called 911. Michael said he remembered asking Janelle what she had done. He thought that perhaps she could not handle the separation and had harmed herself. The paramedics arrived at Janelle's apartment around 9.20 a.m. They immediately determined that she was not alive anymore. Investigators found that Janelle had been beaten and tortured over a period of time, probably to get information from her. She had been shot in the head twice and stabbed five times. Janelle had been beaten so badly that her jaw was broken in two places. Investigators believed at least two people were responsible due to the brutality of the slaying. The kitchen window was the point of entry. There was a footprint impression on the chair below the window inside of the apartment. The kitchen had been ransacked, the cabinets were opened, and it appeared as if someone had been searching through the cereal boxes. It is believed that Janelle's life was taken during the night of September 13th in her bedroom. Investigators found a frayed piece of duct tape which probably was used as some kind of binding. The duct tape had blood on it and there were latex gloves found near Janelle's body. The evidence was collected and stored so that it could be used later. Michael was interviewed by the police, as he was the one that first found her body. Police first tried to collect any information about his relationship with Janelle. Michael admitted that they were still sometimes having relations. He said he felt like the questions were very evasive, but the police needed as much information as they could. Michael said he was visiting a friend on the night that Janelle's life was ended. His alibi was looked into. The police spoke to Michael's friend. His phone records didn't put him anywhere near Janelle's apartment on the night of the crime. Michael also consented to a DNA swab. Two days after Janelle's slaying, a newspaper article came out. In the article, it said Michael was her estranged husband and Janelle was found slain in her home. The article also mentioned that the divorce was to be finalized on October 6th. Michael realized that people thought he was responsible for taking her life. Michael said everyone turned on him. Janelle's family and their colleagues all believed he was responsible. Michael's friend was an attorney. He agreed to defend him pro bono. 
he was told not to speak to anyone. When Michael returned back to work, he had a memo on his desk saying he could not teach anymore or have any contact with students. Michael met the school officials with his attorney. It was recommended to him that he take a desk job while the investigation was ongoing. On November 10th of 2009, two months after Janelle's body was found, the DNA came back from on the duct tape. The duct tape had Michael's DNA on it. Janelle's DNA was also found on it from the blood that was left behind. The police believed that Janelle had been duct taped to a chair before the attack. Michael claimed that the tape had been stuck to his shoe when he found Janelle, so he used his hands to pull it off, and that was why his DNA was on it. Realizing no one believed that he was innocent, Michael turned to alcohol and even contemplated taking his own life. There was also DNA found on the pink lighter, but it unfortunately came back as inconclusive. All of the evidence was transferred to the New York City Medical Examiner's Office for additional analysis. A few months after Janelle's slaying, investigators were still receiving tips. One neighbor believed he had heard a loud noise. One woman said her dogs were awoken by the noise. A tall black male that did not live in the complex was spotted near the apartment acting suspiciously. Many people close to Janelle were angry that these neighbors had been sitting on this information for months. On December 3rd of 2012, three years after the crime, the police learned that they had a DNA match from the lighter. It came back as belonging to Gregory Jean Baptiste, a Bloods gang member. He was then questioned by the police. Baptiste said that he had never seen Janelle before and had never been at her apartment. The police went in circles with Baptiste as he would not confess to anything. After 27 minutes, he refused to talk anymore. Michael reached out to a friend to help clear his name. The friend went out to talk to people in the area. The friend actually got crucial information and Michael told police about what he had heard. Apparently, gang members were looking for a drug dealer named David James, aka Munch. David lived directly next to Janelle. It was rumored that David had $15,000 in a freezer. His girlfriend was overheard by these people talking about drugs at a party. They ended up at the wrong apartment and assumed Janelle was the girlfriend of David. Investigators then went out searching for anyone who would talk. Finally, an informant gave them three names. A fourth person, a woman, was their getaway driver. The men were identified as Ebenezer Bird, Gregory Jean Baptiste, and Jerry Spaulding. All three were part of the Bloods gang. The woman was later identified as Elizabeth Pinto, a former girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird. It was on December 1st of 2015 that a woman named Narika Scott identified Elizabeth Pinto as the getaway driver. Narika had been Ebenezer Bird's current girlfriend. She went to the police after hearing his confession during one of their prison visits. It was clear to the police that she had been very afraid to come forward. Elizabeth Pinto was interviewed. She was also afraid to talk. She finally said Janelle deserved justice and admitted that she was the getaway driver. She said that all three men dressed in black and told her where to drive. Pinto was shown photos of all three men and she was able to identify them by name. She said she did not know where she was driving to. She agreed to show where she had dropped them off. She pled guilty to conspiracy and agreed to testify against all three men. Pinto was also able to tell the police that all three men had put on latex gloves. 
Pinto dropped them off nearby and watched them walk across the street towards the apartment. On March 23rd of 2016, all three men were charged with taking Janelle's life, second degree robbery, conspiracy and unlawful weapons charges. They all maintained their innocence. The trial began on January 17th of 2019. Elizabeth Pinto was the star witness for the prosecution. The defense argued that Michael was the real culprit. The defense claimed that there was still a lot of evidence that had not been tested. The prosecutors believed that Janelle was home alone on September 13th of 2009. Elizabeth Pinto went to the home of Bird's mom and found all three men there. They had her drive them over to the Brighton Arms apartments. Baptiste went in through the window and dropped his lighter. He then opened the sliding door to let the others in. Janelle was in her bedroom. Before the attack, they taped her to a chair. They were searching for the money and drugs, but realized that they were in the wrong apartment. They shot Janelle, probably so she would not identify them. The phone records of all three men placed them at Janelle's apartment. They were all found guilty of taking Janelle's life, robbery, conspiracy, and weapons charges. A fourth man, James Fair, was also found guilty of conspiracy to commit burglary. He had been the one to spread the word that David kept his money in the freezer. They were all sentenced to life in prison. Elizabeth Pinto pled guilty to conspiracy and was sentenced to probation. Their crime spree, which spans over 28 years, is over, said Superior Court Judge Joseph W. Oxley. James Fair is serving an 82-year sentence from unrelated charges. One of Melton's sisters, Connie Sadler, told the judge about the victim's dedication to her profession and her students. Janelle was not just a teacher by profession, Connie said. It was her mission. I believe Janelle knew that teaching was her calling from God. Janelle wanted to do more than inspire students academically. She wanted to make a real and lasting impact in their hearts and their lives. What the three men did to her sister was a heinous and demonic act, Connie said. But, she added, I know Janelle is a Christian and she would want me to forgive them. I pray for them and I pray that God will have mercy on them, but every action has a consequence. Michael Melton went to rehab and he is now focusing on his basketball spotlight company. He said that after he had heard about what really happened to Janelle, half of him was feeling relieved because they knew it was not him who did that to Janelle. The other half is feeling heavily distraught because she lost her life over some money. He said, Now, my life is really not about me anymore. It's about working for the community and trying to help save people's lives. That's what gives me the peace and motivation I have each day. I was given a second chance, so I have to do the best I can with the gift I've gotten. Fifty-one-year-old Paul Stephen Jandreau lived in Moyoc, North Carolina in 2010. He had two daughters, Stephanie and Christina. Paul had been married several times. He was a retired Navy chief. Before retiring from the Navy, Paul earned the ranking of Grand Master Chief. Paul's brother Mike described him as a stand-up guy and had many close friends and family members. His wife at the time was Leticia Chandro. They met in 2002 at a kickboxing class. Leticia was 29 years old a competitive bodybuilder, and an accomplished sportswoman. She even won the National American Sports Federation's North Carolina Bodybuilding Championship in June of 2010. Leticia worked in human resources at a children's hospital in Norfolk, Virginia. 
Letitia was described as very shy, but Paul really wanted to get to know her. He proposed that they become workout partners and the relationship seemed to blossom. Paul had been married when he first met Letitia, but he was just waiting for his divorce to be finalized. Paul and Letitia were an unlikely pair, and the complete opposites of each other. Paul was outgoing, and Letitia was quiet and shy. After a few months of dating, Paul asked Letitia to move in with him. In May of 2003, Paul's divorce was finalized, and a month later, he married Letitia. They were described as happy and affectionate with one another. In 2009, Letitia started working for Blackwater Airlines and continued to train for her bodybuilding competitions. She had won or placed in the top for several competitions. Paul would travel to the competitions with her and brag about her accomplishments to his friends. On June 30th of 2010, Paul did not show up for work. He worked for a company that services Navy ships. He usually came into work around 5.30 a.m. and had been working on an important presentation. Around 7.45 a.m., Paul's co-workers reported him missing. Paul led a very punctual life, so his co-workers were immediately concerned. Deputy Sheriff Lisa Starcher from the Currituck County Sheriff's Office drove out to the Jandro home to perform a welfare check. Starcher arrived at Paul's Brumsey Landing home. There were multiple cars spotted in the driveway, but no one answered the door. Paul's co-workers contacted Letitia through her workplace to see if she knew where he was. Letitia said she did not and left work to meet with the deputy. Letitia allowed the deputy into the house. She explained that she and Paul slept in separate bedrooms due to the noise of Paul's CPAP machine. But when she entered Paul's bedroom, the machine was gone. Letitia explained that they had an open relationship and were both seeing other people. Letitia said Paul most likely just left on his own to stay with one of these other women. But after a few days of back and forth and no news of Paul's whereabouts, the authorities determined some foul play was involved. Paul's co-workers came to the same conclusion. They went out looking for him and handed out missing persons flyers. It was clear that everyone respected and loved Paul. On July 1st of 2010, the police were notified that Paul's phone had pinged off a tower in Elizabeth City about 30 minutes from his house. The police canvassed nearby hotels and learned that Paul may have been spotted at a Hampton Inn. The manager of the hotel was shown Paul's photo and said that she saw him the night before and that morning. She said that Paul was acting odd, however, this turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. Paul had not registered at the hotel and he was not seen on any of the surveillance cameras. Later that same day, a construction worker found Paul's phone in the parking lot of an elementary school in Elizabeth City. The construction worker had called Paul's brother, Mike Jandro, who said that his brother was missing. The construction worker then turned Paul's phone into the Elizabeth City Police Department. The police continued to canvass the area near the elementary school. A utility worker also claimed to have spotted Paul walking down the street. However, the police were sure that it was a case of mistaken identity, which they would later be right about. Still on July 1st, the police received a 911 call from one of Paul and Letitia's neighbors. They had spotted Letitia and an unknown man moving furniture from the house. The man was later identified as Letitia's brother, 39-year-old Eugene Askew. When the police arrived, they told Letitia to move the furniture back into the house. 
she complied and said she was getting some new furniture and taking the old stuff to put in storage. Letitia and Paul's neighbors had also noticed that Letitia was putting things up on the windows to keep people from looking in. Letitia had used wrapping paper and frosting spray to cover up the windows. The neighbors and co-workers told the police that things in the Jandro's marriage had taken a dark turn. After trying to have a baby, Letitia had gotten pregnant with twins after going through several rounds of IVF. Letitia ended up losing the babies about 21 weeks into the pregnancy. Letitia had also said they were separating and both seeing other people. Paul's co-workers said that Paul had filed for divorce and wanted Letitia out of the house. Two weeks before he disappeared, Paul had filed a report that someone had keyed his car. Paul kept his beloved Dodge Charger in pristine condition. The police learned that it had most likely been Letitia because the car had been kept in the garage. Letitia had mentioned this to the police, but never admitted to doing it. On July 2nd, Letitia agreed to turn over Paul's personal computer. But when the police went to the Jandro's house, she wasn't there. The note on the door said, went to River's Edge, call me on my cell, thanks. However, Letitia did not answer her phone. Letitia ended up calling 911 to report that people were outside her house when she was not home. She told the dispatcher that she was in Chesapeake, Virginia. The dispatcher was able to trace the phone call from the Brunsey Landing home. Letitia was inside the house and her behavior had become very odd. Just after midnight on July 3rd, the police returned to the house with a search warrant. Letitia did not answer the door. The police found the garage door unlocked, but it was barricaded with heavy garbage. They were eventually able to make entry and found Letitia hiding in a closet covered by clothes. Letitia was read her rights and claimed she had been hiding because she was afraid that people thought that she did something to Paul. She kept her head in her hands and would not make eye contact. While Letitia was being questioned, other detectives were searching the house. In a twist, in the master bedroom where Paul slept, the police found blood spatter, a bullet hole in the wall, and a bullet skid mark under a rug. The rug had been glued to the floor. In the garage, the police discovered a blue tote. A shower curtain was taped over the top of the tote. After removing the shower curtain, the police were hit with the smell of decomposition. Paul's body was recovered under several layers of plastic, tape, and kitty litter. He was shot with a 45 caliber handgun five times, once each in the abdomen, chest, thigh, neck, and hand. Paul had about 12 lacerations to his head that were consistent with being struck by a blunt object such as a pistol. His cell phone was missing from the residence. Officers discovered an assortment of cleaning supplies in the residence and reported that the primary bedroom's hardwood floor looked like it had been scrubbed. The officers also confiscated spent bullets from the scene. They also confiscated duct tape, caulking, and plastic wrap among other items from the kitchen. Letitia was confronted about what they had found. She then spun a story about how she had hired several men in Elizabeth City to beat up Paul. She said she met random men on the street in Elizabeth City and said that Paul was mistreating her. The police did not believe Letitia and they arrested her. In yet another twist, after spending about a day in jail, Letitia said she wanted to talk. Now, she said, she did take Paul's life, but in self-defense. 
Letitia said Paul attacked her on the morning of July 30th of 2010. She said he came into her room with a gun and said he wanted her out of the house by the time he came home from work. Letitia said she grabbed her gun, a 45 millimeter, walked to Paul's bedroom and just kept shooting. She said they struggled even after he was shot several times. The police recovered Letitia's gun from her car at the house. The gun was registered to one of Letitia's boyfriends, Kyle Koenig, a retired Air Force general. She had stolen the gun from him. Letitia had been sued by another boyfriend. The police found a copy of the lawsuit at the house. The man claimed he had been taken advantage of by Letitia. Letitia had asked for money and claimed that she was pregnant with his twins. The man spoke to Paul about it and Paul filed for divorce. A receipt was also found in the house for the purchase of the tote. Letitia was seen on surveillance footage at Lowe's buying the tote. In September of 2012, Letitia testified at her trial. She maintained her story that she had shot Paul in self-defense. However, the evidence did not match with her story. Paul had suffered from multiple gunshot wounds and severe blunt force trauma. There was a bullet hole found in the master bedroom door. It is believed that Paul had the door closed and that he had been ambushed by Letitia. Letitia shot him several times and hit him in the head with the gun. The attorney and one of his co-workers also alleged that Paul had told them about one night when he woke up to find Letitia crawling across his room. Paul reportedly told his attorney that he used to keep the door of his room locked from then on. Paul's brother Mike said he had last met with Paul in February while attending the Daytona 500 stock car race. He also testified that Paul had told him about his marital problems and also alleged that Letitia was cheating on him. Mike reminisced. He'd been talking about divorce for weeks. He told me she was cheating on him and that he had plenty of evidence. He said he just needed her to get out of his house so he could have his life back. The jury deliberated for an hour and 40 minutes. On September 28th of 2012, Letitia was found guilty of taking Paul's life and larceny of a firearm. She was sentenced to life without parole. Letitia's appeal was denied in 2014. It is believed that she took Paul's life because she did not want to give up the lifestyle he had given her. She was a master manipulator and used Paul and several other men. As per official records, Letitia is presently incarcerated at Anson Correctional Institution in Polton, North Carolina. Thank you.